Hi folks, and welcome to our video on Siegfried Krakauer's The Mass Ornament. It's an essay from 1927. Siegfried Krakauer is a well-known film theorist, German film theorist, who wrote three major pieces of work that are sort of divided in film studies. The first one is a collection of essays that was discovered and translated into English rather late in the history of film studies. It's a collection of cultural criticism under the title Mass Ornament. The second, perhaps the most famous of Krakauer's works, is a book called From Caligari to Hitler, A Psychological History of the German Film, he wrote in 1947. And the third is a large work of realist film theory written in 1960 in English called Theory of Film. Each of these works is very different. Theory of Film is a tome of realist film theory that folks are going to associate with the work of Andre Bazin. The first two books are more political and historical, at least on the surface. The first one folks are going to associate with the Frankfurt School of Cultural Criticism, which Siegfried Krakauer was a prominent member of. The second book is a rare instance, an early instance, of what you might call political or historical film criticism that reads films not as art objects, but as symptoms of a particular society and indicative of historical change. Importantly, the historical change that would lead slowly but surely to the Third Reich in Germany. So I do want to kind of preview the work of Siegfried Krakauer by saying that oftentimes when someone is writing about the work of Krakauer, they may be writing about one Krakauer rather than another Krakauer. To talk about Krakauer's realism is very different than to talk about Krakauer's Frankfurt School cultural criticism. Of course, there have been major attempts to synthesize these two works, especially in the work of people like Miriam Hansen. If you just take a look at these books, they're not going to sound or feel similar at all. So we're going to be focusing on this first text, The Mass Ornament. It's associated, once again, with the Frankfurt School. What is the Frankfurt School? It's a school of social theory and critical philosophy associated with the Institute for Social Research at Goethe University, Frankfurt, in 1929. It was founded during the Weimar Republic, um, and some big names associated with that are other people we've talked about on this channel before, Walter Benjamin and Theodor Adorno. The Frankfurt School is a complex network of thinkers, but for our purposes, we can think about just a couple things that unite them. They're often synthesizing the work of Marx and Freud. They're largely critical of capitalism. Another important thing is that people like Walter Benjamin, Krakauer, and Adorno are known for looking at works of mass culture, film, stage production, that kind of thing. So let's get into the text, The Mass Ornament from 1927. So the first thing that you want to start with is defining what this thing mass ornament is, or rather, what is he referring to when he's saying the term mass ornament? So the first thing that Krakauer will single out as an example of a mass ornament is the Tiller Girls, a popular dance troupe from the 1890s, or which started in, in the 1890s, best known for precisely choreographed high kicking routines. Members were selected for uniform height and weight. You may not know the name The Tiller Girls, but you're probably very familiar with The Rockettes, um, directly inspired by The Tiller Girls, um, formed in 1925 and still performs today. Other kinds of entertainments that are going to be associated with the mass ornament, the, probably the biggest one in film studies is going to be Busby Berkeley musical numbers, which, interestingly enough, had not existed at the time that Krakauer wrote his essay on the mass ornament, but is more or less perfectly described as a kind of cinematic fulfillment of what he's talking about uh, with the Tiller Girls. We can also think about other entertainments and institutions like marching band drills and really any precise geometric moving configuration of many human beings. Um, the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games opening ceremonies um, is a great example of this and is often brought up in the language of mass ornament. So why does he call these things mass ornaments? Well, let's just think about those two words for a second. A mass is a large number of people or objects crowded together. And usually when we think about masses in uh, the humanities or in critical studies more generally, we think about political movements. We often think about mass psychology and the dangers that come with a mass. On the other hand, we have an ornament. An ornament is, in terms of a dictionary definition, a thing used to make something look more attractive, but usually having no practical purpose. Those two things, beauty and attractiveness and having no practical purpose, are a perfect encapsulation of what Krakauer is trying to get at. So if you put those two things together, you might say a mass ornament for Krakauer is a beautiful or at least aesthetically pleasing arrangement of a mass of human bodies for no purpose other than 
as an entertainment or an attraction. So let's get into the kinds of things that Krakauer is going to say. This essay is broken up into six parts. We're only going to focus on the first two parts in this essay. This is an incredibly dense piece of writing, and I would be comfortable only assigning the first two pieces in, say, an undergraduate film studies class. Though it is worth reading and studying the entire thing, I will warn you this gets incredibly abstract. But he starts out simple enough. His first sentence is this. He says the position that an epic occupies in the historical process can be determined more strikingly from an analysis of its inconspicuous surface level expressions than from that epic's judgments about itself. He continues, the surface level expressions, however, by virtue of their unconscious nature, provide unmediated access to the fundamental substance of the state of things. Conversely, knowledge of the state of things depends on the interpretation of these surface level expressions. So right off the bat, he's invoking some pretty heavy Freudian language in order to make a large statement about what it means to do analysis of mass cultural objects. To put this simply, he's saying that societies and cultures can be analogized to human beings in the Freudian worldview. A Freudian approach to interpreting the human psyche is to say that there are two layers. There is what is conscious and what is unconscious. And the problem with the human psyche is that the conscious is not aware of the unconscious and that lack of awareness leads to neuroses or problems. And the way to bring those unconscious thoughts or desires or feelings to the surface is to do analysis or reflection upon what we're conscious of or upon particular phenomena that end up rising to the surface like dreams or slips of the tongue. And Krakauer is more or less saying that we can look at mass cultural objects like mass ornaments kind of like dreams for a Freudian psychoanalyst. We can interpret them as symptoms of a culture or a society. We can learn something about that culture or society by looking at the things that everyone consumes. And frankly, this approach is not that dissimilar from what he does in his book From Caligari to Hitler, A Psychological History of the German Film, in which he looks at the history of German film retroactively after the emergence of Hitler and the Third Reich to say that hey, if we look closely at the cultural output of this nation, we can see the symptoms of a growing fascism in the culture. The objects that the people made and that the people consumed were indicative of what was going on in the national psyche. So he might say this, just to summarize. He says, he might be saying, I'm beginning with the defense of interpretive or allegorical reading as such. But instead of reading art objects for their intended meanings, I'm going to read mass cultural objects for how they reflect socio-historical conditions. I think this is pretty important, this distinction between high art that we read to, say, understand the intentions of an artist, or to understand, say, broad humanist values, um, as opposed to reading mass cultural objects for what they tell us about society. He'll even elaborate on this later in the essay. He'll say, no matter how low one gauges the value of the mass ornament, its degree of reality is still higher than that of artistic productions, which cultivate outdated noble sentiments in obsolete forms, even if it means nothing more than that. So the tension in this passage is something that we still kind of talk about in film studies today. The tensions between, say, a cultural studies approach to reading objects as symptoms of society and, say, an aesthetics approach to films that reads them as art objects to be analyzed with themes and meanings and significations. And really what the Frankfurt School was all about was more so the former. Its aim was to do social theory and to look at society through the cultural output that it produced. And if we continue, we can see just how important the popularity and international popularity of the Tiller Girls and other mass ornaments was to Krakauer's argument. He'll say, these extravagant spectacles, which are staged by many sorts of people and not just girls in stadium crowds, have long since become an established form. They have gained international stature and are the focus of aesthetic interest. Once again, Krakauer wants to state the importance of the popularity of the things that he's analyzing. He doesn't apologize for it. In fact, he says it's far more important to analyze that which is popular than it is to analyze something that is marked by the value of high culture. Okay, now let's get into the meat of the essay with uh, section two, which is a dense section that more or less contains all the important terms that he's going to discuss in the remainder of the essay and gives us some arguments. You might consider this section as answering the question, what are mass ornaments cultural symptoms of? 
So let's take a look at this first passage that he uses to introduce his approach and his argument about mass ornaments. He says, in the domain of body culture, which also covers the illustrated newspapers, tastes have been quietly changing. The process began with the Tiller girls. These products of American distraction factories are no longer individual girls, but indissoluble girl clusters whose movements are demonstrations of mathematics. As they condense into figures in the reviews, performances of the same geometric precision are taking place in what is always the same packed stadium, be it in Australia or India, not to mention America. The tiniest village, which they have not yet reached, learns about them through the weekly newsreels. One need only glance at the screen to learn that the ornaments are composed of thousands of bodies, sexless bodies, and bathing suits. The regularity of their patterns is cheered by the masses, themselves arranged by the stands in tier upon ordered tier. Okay, so we have a lot here. Let's break it down into individual sentences. Let's start here with this term distraction factories. There's a lot bound up in simply the use of this term, which was something that Krakauer used throughout his writing. And we can just think of the distraction factory as a metaphor for the places where the middle class spends its leisure time. It's inherently critical of the notion of leisure time as something that is just as prescribed as work time, but often under the guise of freedom. We tend to think of leisure time as our free time, the thing that we are working in order to have. But the Frankfurt School critics are trying to get us to understand that our free time or our leisure time is just as determined by social structures as is the work time that we very much consider not our own. And you can see the resonance of the term distraction factory in the more famous term culture industry, which was coined in an essay by Horkheimer and Adorno. Okay, so what else do we have? Let's check out this phrase. He says that be it in Australia or India, not to mention America, even the tiniest village is getting an awareness, is getting exposed to the Taylor girls and other mass ornaments. So we might say it's important once again that mass ornaments are not only popular, but they defy national boundaries. They form a mass culture. He's gonna come back to this notion, but I want you to just, I wanted to single it out for now. Okay, and what does he say about the nature of the entertainment, the mass ornament? He describes it this way. Indissoluble girl clusters whose movements are demonstrations of mathematics. So he might say, within a mass ornament, individual dancers lose their individuality for the sake of the whole, the geometric figure or shape. We can see that in a Busby Berkeley musical number in which we see these geometric patterns often with these overhead cameras. We can equally see it in the famous chorus line kicking routines of the Tiller Girls and the Rockettes. The fundamental principle here is, of course, that we know and we can see that these geometric shapes are composed of individual human beings. But it's a kind of perceptual game of part and whole. What we see is the whole, even though we're aware of the part. Krakauer adds to this idea of individualism or the individual being forsaken for a whole. He says, it is the mass that is employed here, only as parts of a mass, not as individuals who believe themselves to be formed from within, do people become fractions of a figure. Now you might say just reading this that Krakauer is saying that mass ornaments are bad because they destroy the individual and what we need in society is a focus on the individual. If you keep reading the essay, you're going to realize it's a lot more complicated than that. But for now, we can just understand that he is describing this as a forsaking of the individual for the whole. Third, he makes this interesting point that there are two masses, the masses of the mass ornament and the mass that is designed to be consumed by. He says, these performances of the same geometric precision are taking place in what is always the same packed stadium. Later, he says, the regularity of their patterns is cheered by the masses themselves arranged by the stands in tier upon ordered tier. So it matters for him that the mass ornament is consumed by a mass audience, themselves arranged within a perfect geometric configuration. So that's a catalog of how Krakauer will initially establish why he's interested in the mass ornament. His second point is a more abstract one. And I'll say this right at the beginning of a paragraph. He says, the ornament is an end in itself. And he's mostly going to make this argument negatively by saying what the ornament is not, even though it seems to be these things. So he'll say, the ornament is an end in itself. For example, it's not erotic. He'll say, the mass movements of the girls take place in a vacuum. They are a linear system that no longer has any erotic meaning, but at best points to the locus of the erotic. 
It's of course not lost on Krakauer that the Tiller girls are composed of girls. That is, young women of a certain age and a very uniform body type. The same goes for Busby Berkeley's performers. And of course, there have been many feminist critiques of Busby Berkeley musical numbers that examine a kind of objectification that happens in these numbers. An objectification sort of in a literal way, where we're not even regarding these women as objects of erotic spectacle, like you'll get in a kind of Laura Mulvey-style male gaze thesis, with a paradigmatic example on your left. But rather, what Berkeley and the Tiller girls are giving us, I think is nicely articulated by Krakauer, no longer has any erotic meaning, but at best points to the locus of the erotic. So Krakauer's major point here is that the mass ornament is not a vehicle of eroticism. Secondly, it's not military or militaristic. He'll say, the meaning of the living star formations in the stadiums is not that of military exercises. The star formations have no meaning beyond themselves, and the masses above whom they rise are not a moral unit like a company of soldiers. So again, it's also not lost on Krakauer that these formations resemble military exercises. But he says that when military exercises are doing these kinds of formations, they are doing so with a practical purpose in mind. If soldiers can move with such utter precision and control, it demonstrates their ability to be precise and controlled within combat. And it also functions as a kind of moral patriotism. They are functioning as a unit. They are sacrificing their individuality for the sake of coming together as a unit of power and defense. Visually, it resembles the mass ornament, but because it has no military ties, that similarity is merely visual. Third, it's not gymnastic, Krakauer will say. One cannot even describe the figures as the decorative frills of gymnastic discipline. Rather, the girl units drill in order to produce an immense number of parallel lines, the goal being to train the broadest mass of people in order to create a pattern of undreamed of dimensions. So once again, it is not lost on Krakauer that these ornaments resemble gymnastic exercises to give it an athletic purpose. So what do we have here? The mass ornament is not a vehicle for eroticism, military might, or athleticism, but an end in itself. What do we make of that? Where is Krakauer going with these sets of observations? Here is the major observation, the major claim of the essay. Like the mass ornament, the capitalist production process is an end in itself. What underlies the major claim of Krakauer's essay, The Mass Ornament, is an analogy between the mass ornament and capitalism. And here's where Krakauer is going to start to elaborate on that analogy. He'll say, the structure of the mass ornament reflects that of the entire contemporary situation, i.e. the capitalist production process. Community and personality perish when what is demanded is calculability. It is only as a tiny piece of the mass that the individual can clamor up charts and can service machines without any friction. A system oblivious to differences in form leads on its own to the blurring of national characteristics and to the production of worker masses that can be employed equally well at any point on the globe. So let's break this down into its component parts. Let's start here. He says, leads to the blurring of national characteristics and the production of worker masses that can be employed equally well at any point on the globe. So here he is actually showing the reason why he was so interested in the internationalism of the Taylor girls. You might say the mass ornament is not simply internationally popular, but in its essence the mass ornament, like capitalism, is indifferent to the nationality of each member. It only needs each member to function as a cog in the machine. Okay, what about the second sentence? He says, community and personality perish when what is demanded is calculability. It is only as a tiny piece of the mass that the individual can clamor up charts and can service machines without any friction. So we might say within a mass ornament, as with capitalism or the capitalist production process, individual dancers lose their individuality for the sake of the whole, the geometric figure or shape. So he's taking that idea of losing your individual self for the sake of the whole. And he's saying the reason that matters is because it resembles the idea of what happens to the worker in a capitalist production process. And throughout a lot of the essay, he's going to elaborate on this very point. So let's look at some of those elaborations. He'll say, everyone does his or her task on the conveyor belt, performing a partial function without grasping the totality. I think this is a really useful 
idea. Think about Charlie Chaplin here in modern times working on the conveyor belt in a Fordist system of factory work. Charlie only knows mechanically what he needs to do, but he doesn't know why he needs to do it. In fact, he's so focused on the mechanism, the mechanics of his body in doing this, that it kind of drives him a little bit crazy if you've watched the film Modern Times. But the idea is that he cannot grasp the totality, the purpose of what he's doing. Marx had a word for this. The effect of this, Marx said, was called alienated labor. He is alienated from the purpose, the reason that he's doing the work that he's doing. So we might say, each tiller girl does her task, but cannot see the totality of which she's a part. In a similar way, Chaplin here, like most factory workers, focuses on his partial task, but is alienated from how that task contributes to what is being manufactured. And we can say the same thing not only of uh, factory workers, but office work, which is a point rendered visually and throughout the film in The Crowd by King Vidor, 1928. Here, as we get introduced to our main character, notice that the camera is moving through this large frame-defying geometric configuration of desks. So we have to zero in on our singular protagonist to even get a sense that there is a single whole being there. Krakauer continues this line of thinking with famous lines like this. He'll say the hands in the factory correspond to the legs of the Tiller girls. Just as the choreographer of these routines and say maybe someone like Busby Berkeley had to conceive of the performers in not just in terms of human beings, but almost in terms of their individual limbs. In a similar way, workers in factories are reduced to what their limbs can do as merely physical appendages. He continues, it is conceived according to the rational principles which the Taylor system merely pushes to their ultimate conclusion. So here Krakauer invokes this guy, Frederick Winslow Taylor, and it's a really helpful invocation. So Frederick Winslow Taylor is associated with Taylorism, which is an approach to measuring human bodily movement to maximize efficiency for production. In some sense, it imposes math or a mathematical way of thinking on the human body for the sake of maximizing efficiency in the workplace or in a factory. And you can see Taylorism kind of ridiculed or spoofed in this cartoon that are defined by the mobility of their limbs. So Krakauer might say, just as Taylor reduced bodies to their component parts to maximize productivity, imposing mathematics onto the human body, the mass ornament reduces human bodies to their limbs to form geometric patterns. In both, rationality is the guiding principle. And with this sentence, perhaps the most important and summative sentence of section two, Krakauer will give what is close to a thesis of his entire essay. He'll say, the mass ornament is the aesthetic reflex of the rationality to which the prevailing economic system aspires. So what this essay is ultimately going to be about is about the geometry and mathematics on display in mass ornaments and how that is a visual emblem of a kind of rationality. Not, say, human reason, which is something that we should all, say, aspire to and believe in, but a kind of rationality, largely what the Frankfurt School critics are going to call instrumental rationality, which has gone too far, which has replaced human concerns with a kind of imposed mathematical thinking that thinks about profits, that thinks about what you can do, what you can achieve, what money you can make, and sacrifices fundamental human concerns. In the next video, we're going to talk about where this essay goes with that idea of rationality and how the mass ornament is an ambiguous and not unambiguously bad figure of what has happened with rationality in the 20th century. I'll see you next time.